Well, today we begin a new message series, which I've entitled, Keep Your Dream Alive. Keep Your Dream Alive. Now, every person in life has a dream, but not everybody knows what their dream is. The dream we're talking about in this series is a special dream. It's a, it's a unique dream that God has for your life. God created you and he has a dream for your life that he wants you to live out. Now, people have all kinds of dreams that are not from God. People dream of all kinds of different things. Some people dream of winning the lottery. Some people dream of great accomplishments that never seem to happen. Other people dream of things that are ungodly. But God has a dream for your life. And it's a good dream for your life. And it's something that you can accomplish with his help. He wants you to keep that dream alive. He wants you to live it out. First verse we want to look at is found in Ephesians 2 verse 10. Now in your bulletin in the middle of it is a white page. I encourage you to pull that out if you haven't already. It looks like this. It has the outline of the message and we encourage you to take some notes there. Fill in the blanks. It has the verses written out and on the back is a series of study questions that correlate with the message this morning. And that's something that you can do in your own personal time to dig in deeper to God's word to apply it. And uh, when the life groups are going and they'll be starting next week, you, we will also be studying that in the life groups as well. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so if you're a believer here this morning, God has prepared good works for you to do in your life. Good works for you to accomplish. And this dream that God has for your life can become reality. Why? Because it says God has prepared everything in advance for us to do it. He's given us the resources. He's put us in the right place. He's put us in the right time. We live in 2013 and not in 1013. Our lives would be very different. But he's put us in the right place and the right time to carry out the things that God has for us. And so often we get caught up in all the little things we have to do in life. You know, we have to get up, we have to brush our teeth, we have to prepare breakfast, and we go to work and all these little things, and they might be part of the dream, but we forget about the bigger dream that God has for us, the things that he wants us to accomplish in our lives. Sometimes we give up on the dream that God has for us and say, it can't be done. I can't do it. I give up. And if you give up on God's dream for you, you're never going to fulfill it. And that would be a tragedy. So today God wants to encourage each of us to keep the dream that God has for you and your life alive. And if you don't know what it is, my prayer is that in this message series, God would reveal it to you. And so our message series this fall is called Keep Your Dream Alive. We're going to be talking about the story of Joseph. It's found in Genesis chapter 37 through 50. And I'd encourage you to read through that as we begin the series. It's only 14 chapters long. I encourage you to read through it so you get the whole story. And as we go through it, it will make more sense to you. Now, one of the things that we're going to learn as we go through Joseph's story is that there are three phases to a dream. And this is true not just of Joseph's dream. It's true of the dreams that God gives us for our lives as well. First of all, you have to discover your dream in order to live it out. If you just go through, wander through life without an aim, without a purpose, you're never going to accomplish God's dream for your life. So we need to discover God's dream for our lives. Secondly, oftentimes, and we see it repeatedly in the case of Joseph, opposition ar arises to a person fulfilling God's dream for them. Things become difficult. It seems like the dream will never be fulfilled. In fact, it appears that the dream may have died. And yet, the third phase of a dream is if you keep the dream alive in your heart, God will eventually resurrect it and you will be able to fulfill that dream that he has given you. And we're going to see these three phases of dreams reflected in Joseph's story. Now today our first message in this series is called Building on Your Past. Building on Your Past. In order to build on your dream, you've got to believe that the dream exists. 
And I believe God's word teaches us that each person here has a dream from God that he wants you to live out. Believe that dream exists and that God wants you to know that dream. Know what that dream is and live it out. One major area that keeps people from fulfilling their dreams is their past. Have you ever thought about your past and had some regrets? Have you ever thought and asked the if only questions? If only my family would have been different. If only my life would have been better or easier. Or perhaps you're thinking, I've had some problems in the past. I've even done some things wrong or somebody else has done something to me. And it's, it's really holding me down. It's preventing me from fulfilling this dream that I know that God has for me. Now as we begin Joseph's story, we're going to see how God works, even in the midst of difficult circumstances, to bring about his purposes. We're going to see how God worked in Joseph's life. And I believe it will be an encouragement to each one of us, because what God did for Joseph, he can do for you. Now, so often when we read through the Bible, we put these men of God or women of God up on some pedestal, and we think we can't possibly be like them. But God has put their stories in the Bible so that we can be encouraged by them. They're examples for us, people who walk with God, people just like you and me, and they fulfill God's dream. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same. The first truth that God wants to teach us today is that God planned your family background. Psalm 39 verse 16 says, Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Now sometimes we think that those who have great success in life, and as we read the entire story of Joseph, eventually he came to a position of high prominence in the government of Egypt. He had great success in his life. I'm kind of giving away the end of the story if you haven't read it. But we think, well, he must have been blessed all the way through his life. It just must have been an easy walk if we just look at the end state of Joseph. But as we'll see, it was not an easy path to the fulfillment of his dream. That, well, he must have been blessed with this great family. But when we look at his family a little closer... I don't know if I'd want to have been in that family. And as we'll see, Joseph's family was really far from perfect. And yet, who put Joseph into his family? God put him there. And he planned the dream for his life before he was born, as he does for us. Your very parents were chosen by God. Anybody here choose their parents? Doesn't work that way, does it? God chose our parents. Joseph's father was Jacob. He's a great man of faith. He's mentioned repeatedly in the Bible. The forefathers of Israel are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And yet, Joseph's family was not a picture of great harmony. Genesis 29, 18, it says, Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Well, we don't have time to read the whole story. I'll summarize it. When Jacob was a young man, he fell in love with a beautiful young woman named Rachel, who was the daughter of his uncle Laban. And Laban was, uh, was a character. And uh, Laban wasn't going to give Rachel to Jacob unless he worked for him for seven years. And so he worked for his uncle Laban for seven years. You know, on the wedding night, when things were dark, Laban snuck in the less good-looking daughter, Leah. And when Jacob woke up after his wedding night, he looked over, and it wasn't Rachel, it was Leah. It was quite a shock. And so he still loved Rachel, and so he chose to work for Laban another seven years. And at the end of those seven years, he married his true love, Rachel, but now he had two wives, Rachel and Leah. Rachel ended up being Joseph's mother. She gave birth to Joseph. And when Joseph was a young boy, his mother, Rachel, became pregnant again with another son named Benjamin. 
But during childbirth, she had great difficulty and his mother passed away when his younger brother was born. And so Joseph had a rough start in life. He not only had a mother who he loved and a stepmother, but his mother passed away when he was still a boy. And yet, God had chosen Joseph's parents. And God chose your parents as well. Your siblings were selected by God. Your brothers, your sisters, or your lack of brothers and sisters if you were an only child. That was selected by God. Let's look at Joseph's brothers and sisters. Leah, his stepmother, had six boys and a girl. Rachel had Joseph and Benjamin. But that wasn't all there was to Jacob's family. Jacob's family was a bit more complex than that. Uh, for you see, Rachel had a servant, Bilhah, and she had two more boys through Jacob. And Leah had a servant named Zilpah, and there was two additional boys through her with the same father. All living together and one happy, blended family. Let's count this up. There were 12 boys and one girl born to one father. And there were four mothers. Now you think everything was very peaceful and harmonious in this family. And yet, this family was the origin of the 12 tribes of Israel. These 12 boys were the origin of the 12 different tribes of Israel. This was the family that God had placed Joseph in. And we'll see that Joseph's time with his family was not the best of times. And yet God had a purpose in all of it because your past prepares you for your future. Isaiah 43 says, Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. And so this is a general principle in God's word that we mustn't live in the past. We mustn't dwell in the past. We need to keep our eyes on the future. We need to keep our eyes on the things that God has for us. Joseph's family background wasn't so great, but it prepared him for the future that God had planned. And we'll see as we study Joseph's life, he did not dwell on his past. He didn't mope on why I was born into a family of four mothers. And 11 brothers. He did not look for ways to take revenge. In fact, we see him always looking to God. We see him always looking to the future. Joseph understood that his past and his family, no matter how imperfect they were, were preparing him for the future that he had with God. When Joseph was finally raised up, as I said before, we'll eventually see in his story, he's raised up to be a leader in Egypt. He had his first son there in Egypt. In verse uh, Genesis 41, 51, it said, Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, It is because God has made me forget all my trouble in all my father's household. And so Joseph was able to put that behind. As we'll see, he had a lot to put behind him and focus on God's dream for his life, the things that God wanted him to accomplish. Your past prepares you for your future. Now, let's move back to the 21st century, the year 2013. How do you view your family of origin. How do you view your mother, your father, your siblings? You know, I've counseled with people whose parents were long gone. They weren't even alive anymore. And the people were still angry and bitter with their parents. Yet others blame their family and the way they were brought up for all their problems in life. I've known of people who will not even speak to a brother or sister because they're so angry at them. And none of those responses to the past is godly. Can you thank God for the parents that he gave you, as imperfect as they were? And some are more imperfect than others. But they gave you life. You wouldn't be here today without them. Can you thank God for the brothers and sisters that you had in your family. 
Or perhaps you didn't have any. It was all part of God's plan for your life. Can you thank your siblings for the good things that they've done for you? God wants your heart to be right with your family. He wants you to forget past problems and move on to the things that he has for you in the future because God has a dream for your life and the dream that he has for your life will be built on the foundations of your past. Even if you're older in life, God has a dream for your remaining years. If God didn't have a plan for your life, you wouldn't be here anymore. He'd have taken you up to heaven. And so if you're alive, if you're breathing, God still has a dream for your life. Now, you may be in the midst of fulfilling that dream, but it's not finished yet. You still have to run the race. You still have to get to the end of the race of life that God has charted out for you. And for the believer, that dream that he has for each one of us extends right into heaven. It extends right into eternal life. And so build on your past. Follow God's dream for your life. Next week, we'll be talking a lot more about those dreams that God has given or wants to give each of us. He has those dreams, but we need to discover the dreams and commit to living them out. The message next week is God-given dreams. So our past prepares us for our future. And as we go on with God in life, we need to choose to live with integrity. Proverbs 13, 6 says, Righteousness guards the man of integrity, but wickedness overthrows the sinner. Now circle that word integrity. I want to focus on that for a minute. What is integrity? Integrity is a quality of possessing or adhering to high moral principles. In the case we're talking about here, it's godly principles, biblical principles. A person of integrity is not divided in their thinking. They don't think this way one day. They don't think another way another day. They are not divided in their thinking. They're not committed to two different things. They're committed to a set of principles, a set of godly principles, and they remain steadfast to that no matter what happens in their lives. A person of integrity doesn't say one thing and do another. He doesn't believe one thing and live in a different way. His life, his life is integrated. His convictions, his beliefs, and his lifestyle are one. They make sense. If you see his lifestyle, you'll, you'll understand what his beliefs are. If you see his beliefs, you'll understand what his life is like. And so as we study the life of Joseph, we will see a man of integrity. He's firm in his commitment to God. He's firm in his godly principles. And when we think, where did he get that? He must have got that from his father. Because as we'll see, he was taken from his home as a teenager. And thrown into a pagan culture. And so that was instilled in him, in his family. To live a life of integrity, you need to submit to authority over you. The actual story of Joseph begins in chapter 37. It says, Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. Two of his father's four wives. And so the story begins with Joseph as a, we call it a teenager. What does the Bible call him? A young man. I don't want to digress too much, but our notion of teenagers who kind of can do what they want, it's an in-between time, is, is not found in the Bible. Uh, teenagers there are called young men or young women. And they work, they serve God, and they're capable of much more than we sometimes think our teenagers are capable of. Now as we see, the story continues. Joseph was working for, he was submitting to his father. His father Jacob, as he was tending the flocks, he was submitting to authority of his father. And we'll see as we go through the story of Joseph that again and again he submits to the authority that God has placed over him. And where did he learn that? He learned that in his family. He learned to obey his father. He learned to do what his father said. He learned not to be swayed uh, by other things to rebel against authority. And we see that as Joseph submitted to authority, God was with him. God was with him here and God was with him as we go through the other phases of his life. 
To live a life of integrity, you must always speak the truth. Verse 2 goes on, as Joseph was tending the flocks, he said he brought his father a bad report about them, about his brothers. Now one of the interesting things about the Bible is that, which drives a lot of people crazy, is that especially in the Old Testament, there's a lot of stories. And the Bible doesn't always tell you if what a certain person did was right or wrong. They want you to use your brain. He wants you to figure it out based on the rest of the story. The clues are all over the place. Commentators vary on whether Joseph was doing something good or bad here. Whether this, giving this bad report was right or wrong. But I think the answer is very obvious. In the context of the whole story of Joseph, how do we see Joseph? We see him as a man of integrity. And we'll see in a couple of messages in the future that his brothers were let me say, not exactly models of integrity. They did many things and just a few verses wrong, more things wrong than Joseph did in his entire life. And so it's quite clear here to me that Joseph is bringing a bad report, but a true report to his father whom he reported to. He was spent, sent to tend the sheep with his brothers and to let his father know what was going on. Now, his brothers were of the type, you know, when the cat is away, the mouse will play. So when the father wasn't watching, they probably did some things. They did some things they shouldn't have been doing. Now, we don't know what those things were, but they weren't good. They were bad. And so, Joseph had a choice to make. Should I cover up my brother's actions? And not report back to my father? Or should I let him know what's really going on? If I let my father know what's going on, I don't think my brothers are going to like it. But what did Joseph do? He chose to tell his father the truth who was in authority over him. He probably knew the consequences wouldn't be good. And sometimes the consequences of telling the truth are not always the best in the immediate sense. But telling the truth is always the right course of action if you want to live with integrity. And when you walk with integrity, God will give you success. Verse 3 says, Now Israel, which is another name for Jacob, it said he loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made him a richly ornamented robe for him. And so his father, Jacob, loved Joseph. Because he was born when he was older. And I'm sure he loved him because he was a boy that did what his father said. He submitted to his authority and I'm sure part of it was he loved Joseph's mother Rachel so much. And so he treated his son, Joseph, in a special way. He gave him a coat of many colors. A special coat. A special robe. Unlike anything any of his brothers had had, probably unlike anything anybody had had. This was probably a very expensive robe. And so the general principle illustrated here for the first time in Joseph's life is that as he submitted to his father's authority from his father, he was granted success, he was granted recognition as he walked in integrity. Now we can debate whether his father should have given him that robe or not. And all different kinds of things there. But the principle is that Joseph was blessed as he walked with integrity. Now just because God grants you success in life as you walk with integrity doesn't mean life is going to be a bed of roses. That doesn't mean you're not going to have any problems. And we're going to see that there. That's a fairy tale that is promoted by some. Walk with God. You're always going to be healthy, wealthy, and whatever else. Well, as we look at Joseph's story, there's a number of things that happened in his life that weren't fair. A number of things that happened that were very difficult. And so we should expect opposition to God's dream. Now, Joseph hasn't had a dream yet. We're going to cover that next Sunday. But yet he's moving in the direction he's laying the foundation to be ready to fulfill that dream. Even 
at a young age, even as a teenager. And so the foundation of your life is laid as a young person. It's very important for parents to raise their children, right? It's very important for children to follow God even in a young age because it sets the stage for the rest of your life. Verse 4 says, When his brothers saw that their father loved him, that's Joseph, more than any of them, they loved him and spoke kindly to him. <laughs> Is that what it says? Oh, I think I read it wrong. When his brothers saw their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. It didn't go over well with these 11 burly brothers. And so here we see the first opposition to Joseph. And his dream. His brothers did not like the fact, I'm sure, that he had given his father a bad report. And they especially didn't like the fact that after that bad report, his father gave him this beautiful robe. And they gave them nothing at all. And so his brothers hated him. They spoke unkindly to him. I'm sure they made his life at home miserable. Now, had Joseph done anything wrong? I don't think so. I don't see it here. I think he was doing the right thing. I think he was paying a price for choosing to live with integrity. I always expect opposition in your life as you live out the dream that God has for you. Don't be surprised by it. It's going to come. It's going to happen. Don't be surprised. Don't be discouraged. And don't give up on your dream when opposition comes. So let's think about our own lives again this morning. When we look back over our lives, when we look back over the past, I'm sure that each one of us can think of times when things didn't go exactly as we had hoped. We can think of times when our family of origin has let us down, our mother, our father, our brothers, our sisters. But you can't change the past. I can't change the past. But we can make a choice to live with integrity today and tomorrow. That's a choice each one of us can make. Choose to submit to the authorities in your life. We're going to see this over and over again in the life of Joseph. Whether they're authority in your family, authority at your job, authority in your church, or the authority of God himself. And as you do that, God will bring you success in life in many different ways. Don't become bitter over your past. Or even opposition that may, you may be facing in the present. Don't become bitter. Don't become angry. Learn to forgive. Learn to, as it were, forget. And move on to the future. To the things that God has for you. Always speak the truth. Don't cover up. Speak the truth with integrity. Live a life of integrity where your actions and words are are pleasing to God. And so today we've begun our study of the life of Joseph. And we're going to see throughout his life that the righteous, people who live with integrity, they may suffer. Evil may come against them. We do live in an unjust and evil world. And yet, God's purpose or God's dream for the righteous will prevail, will triumph in the end. Nothing can stop. No one can stop God's dream and purpose for your life if you live a life of integrity and obedience to God. And that gives us great hope. So I encourage you today to choose to believe and trust your life and your dreams into God's hands. He's the one that has those dreams for your life. And even though you may be suffering, even though you may be encountering some kind of opposition to the things you feel God wants to do in your life, don't give up. Because if you give up, all is lost. Keep that dream alive. God will see you through. And I encourage you this week to get the most out of this message series. Read through Genesis 37 to 50. It's only 14 chapters. And as you see the whole story, it will help you as we go through it Sunday by Sunday. Keep everything in perspective. And finally, be praying about who you can invite to hear this series. Because I really believe this is a word from God. It's God's word, but I believe it's a timely word. To keep the dream alive that will 
help many people. Now, in order to live a life of integrity with God, you need to commit your life to Jesus Christ. You need to admit that you've sinned, that you've done wrong things. Believe that Jesus died on the cross, that your sins might be forgiven, and commit your life to following him in all his ways. To become a Christian is not simply asking God to forgive you and then living out your personal dream for your life. That's not what a Christian is. In fact, you're not a Christian if that's what you're doing. To become a Christian, you ask God to forgive your sins and you commit your life to Him as your Lord. And that means your Lord, your Master, your authority has a dream for your life. He has a plan and you commit yourself to living out that plan. That's what a Christian is. You cannot have Jesus as your Savior if He's not your Lord. Many people are deceived. And so today we're going to pray a simple prayer. I'd like to ask you to bow your heads right now. If you've never committed your life to Jesus Christ and asked Him to forgive your sins and committed yourself to Him as Lord of your life, that you might live out His dream for your life, then I'd encourage you to pray along with me. Father, today, I admit that I've sinned. I've done wrong things. I've been following my own dream for my life, not yours. And I've done things that were sin. Please forgive me. But I believe that Jesus Christ came to this earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, took my sins upon himself that I might be forgiven and rose from the dead three days later. I commit myself to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I commit myself to following his way and his dream and his word in my life with all that I am for all my days. And for those of us who are believers, let's pray that God would help us to fulfill the dream he has for us. Father, we thank you, God, for your word, for the Bible, for these examples of men that lived thousands of years ago and yet teach us lessons that we can apply to our lives today. We're grateful, God, that you've planned out every detail for our lives. We thank you that you planned our families that we were to be born in. We thank you that you gave us the parents that you did. We thank you that you gave us the brothers and sisters and relatives that you did. I pray that each person here would be thankful for their families and that you would use them in their families to spread your word and your truth. May no one harbor any unforgiveness or bitterness. We thank you, God, that our past has prepared us for our future, the future that you have for us. And I pray, God, as we go through this message series, that you'd help every person here to discover in greater detail the dream that you have for them and the part that is yet to be fulfilled. I pray that we would help us to grow in understanding and carrying out that dream. Teach us to submit to the authorities that you've given us in, your life, in our lives and, and grant us success in the things that we lay our hands to as we follow you. And God, when we encounter difficulties and opposition in life, I pray that you'd give us the strength and the resolve to keep our dream alive and to trust you and rely on your strength until we break through. Give us opportunities, God, this week we pray to invite others to church to hear more from your word about keeping our dreams alive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.